you're starting the next environment with the assumption, you know, you've pre-staged yeah. that someone has. So we are going to use Red Hat Lab today. And um, they have a check button at the end of each module that checks to make sure that you're in the right spot. If you're not, I don't know what happens. I don't know if it like corrects everything that starts you at like the next module in a known good state. Um, yeah, so we, we recently moved to a company called Destruct for a lot of our labs, and they seem to run the modules. We've gotten some positive feedback on them. We've also heard some people say the terminal window is too small, the test is too small. Um, but we'll see how it feels after this yeah. lab. So the name of, the, of today's session is uh, Ready for a Sensible Playbook with Will Sevens. I'm not Will Sevens. My name is Ted Cornell. Yes, I work at Red Hat, and along with Peter. Um, Peter and I have both been there. Peter's been even been there for like 13 or 14 years, right? Almost 13. Yeah. yeah, and I've been there for 11 and a half. So we've been around a lot. I've held with, um, we're both part of the North American public sector. If you're not anymore, you're North American? I'm in a con. Wow. So we're both part of the North America <laughs> sales conglomerate uh, that has two teams that, that love each other a lot, the commercial team and the public sector uh, It's all part of the same thing. Like yeah. That. And uh, we realized yesterday that our speaker was going to be here. Well, we, Tuesday we go, we haven't heard from him. <laughs> yeah, we haven't heard from him. So we started reaching out to him. I was up in Boston at that summit. And uh, neither one of us are back from him. So I was like, well. Nothing else. I'll just show up early. I'll get something prepared really quick. Someone has um, the time to do that. Some of us. We, <laughs> Peter and I are both used to talking about Ansible, so yeah. I decided to find something back here. I'll throw something together. So, yes, there are Red Hat logos on the screen. We usually try to avoid that. This is not a Red Hat user group, it's a Linux user group. So, we like to um, keep it more about Linux and less about Red Hat, the company we work for. So ignore all the red hat, color scheme, logos. We're using the engine something. here, the engine that any distribution out there can get a hold of. If so. you see something that says Ansible Automation Platform, just know that that's the same thing as Ansible. And um, Automation Platform is what Red Hat sells. It is based on the open source project Ansible. And the Ansible controller is also an open source project based on an open source project called AWS. So if you guys see anything that says Ansible Controller, just remember that's AWX. You'll see Ansible Automation Platform, which is controller plus work notes. That's known as the larger project called Ansible. Okay? All right. So Ansible Crash Course. There we go. My computer is being very slow today. All right. So first we'll do a little background on Ansible, the way that we got, what we, how we, we, we acquired this company called Ansible. I saw that app. Um, got this product. It was created, the Ansible company was created by a former Red Hat software developer named Michael DeHaan. Michael DeHaan, if anybody here has ever used Satellite 5 um, or an open source project called Cobbler, which was great for provisioning Yay. systems, that was a piece of software that Michael DeHaan wrote while he was at Red Hat. He wanted to get into configuration management and things like that. And Red Hat's like, no, that's just not a space for ready playing. So he left Red Hat and started a company that could do configuration management called Ansible. Um, after a while, we started seeing that this was becoming more and more popular. There was great, hey, come on in. Good to see you. Find a chair. Um, we saw that this was something that a lot of enterprise level IT companies were beginning to really get into and focusing a lot of energy and resources and stuff on so we're like wow you know that ansible company over there that's that's kind of stuff just like red hat is they have open source software they're based on projects they sell subscriptions so it was a good easy fit for us so uh, michael dehan left ansible and then we acquired the company so um and, and a bunch of old red hatters yeah he did come <laughs> back to red hat but the other 150 <laughs> whatever the number was, the Red Hat or Seven Plus to go to. Nansville all came back. And uh, most of them still work at Red Hat with Red Hat. Yeah. I feel like he just hates Red Hat. No, you, you missed an opportunity. Uh, yeah. He didn't, he didn't, the Red Hat Nansville went in talks to be acquired um, when he decided to leave. He was like, okay, you know what? This is getting too big for me. I'm out. So he likes to work in this little startup. 
Uh, he got um, a pretty good payout anyway. So. Yeah. So, um, but that's how Red Hat acquired Ansible. Um, and kind of the fun story behind it that was started by former Red Hatter, created a company that operated a lot like Red Hat and then they acquired that. Um, and that was all way previous to IBM. Um, all right. So, the way Ansible works is it uses a concept called playbooks. Playbooks can be organized in different, uh, several different ways. Um, but inside of a playbook, they can be um, organized as roles, they can be organized as collections. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is just the basic playbook kind of functionality because the name of the session is Write the First Playbook. So, playbooks have a couple of different um, parts to them. And that is um, every playbook has a task which is listed in the name field. The name field is free form. You can type, whatever, type in whatever you want. Um, and then the module is the, is the next line. So right here, the module is called package. And so that's going to do something with a package. Go ahead. Package management. Um, it's just not, the recommendation today, the best practices will not have you write like that, but this will still work for yeah. the foreseeable future. But just keep in mind that that may actually change. Yeah. Well, you have to fully qualified. You have basically do fully qualified module names, yes, because yeah. the same module name, the short version, may exist in multiple collections. So yeah. it's better to be, you know, to avoid misunderstandings and have issues of which one comes first and all that stuff. Yeah. And you guys will see some of that while we go through the language, how, how that's involved with that. But as far as basic syntax goes, you create a task. You tell it which module it's going to use, and then it provides some parameters for that particular module. So, um, in this example, the two modules are the module that we use is called package. The parameters are name, HTTP, and then its state, which is present. So, what Ansible is going to do here is it's going to use the available package manager, whatever it is, young, DNF, app, app, get, whatever. And it's going to make sure that the HTTP package is present. So it's definitely multi-platform. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I can so I can use this to automate my hodgepodge of VMs and Yeah. So just to clarify, depending on how you write your playbook, you make it more or less multi-platform. If I if I use the package module, it's more yeah. transportable. If I specifically yeah. say Yum or App, we're kind of yes. grounded yeah, in. However, it is to have Ansible. Um, look at which operating system it's running on. Yeah. So if you can sit there and say, hey, if the OS is Ubuntu, use the app exactly. model. Yeah, I never fed yeah. that Fedora, whatever, use DNF. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem with yeah. something like that is, you know, of course, and this is just off the top of my head, you know, different operating systems have different dependencies. You know, you may get, you may get, you may install this. You may get a different configuration on some machine than you want than on others if you're not careful. If you don't explicitly say what you want. You know. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That is, like, I don't know how the fact that it's useful because, it's it's like, uh, you installed it. You uh, uh, read that, but HTTP is not a package that's made for that, whereas I'd love to almost certainly is. Yeah, the package name almost never are the same yeah. Yeah. platform, so I don't know why I'm doing yeah. packages. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the check the OS comes in. Right? That's, the, that's more advanced than when you first play with it. When you first play with it, it's like, yeah. all right. So, um, but the, like I said, so there's uh, thousands of um, packages. If you know some ones that are listed, they're like EC2, which, one you install, which have is had obviously Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. You have yeah. WinRegEdit, which is yeah. obviously a Windows thing. And then you have uh, Juno's config, which is obviously the Juniper operating system for Juniper switches, right? Ansible can talk to pretty much any. There are large organizations that use Ansible to manage you know, Windows register. Yes, that's. You can also use Windows packages. There's a module called Chopper that uh, installs the Windows packages. So. Um, and they have a built-in one. Windows. Oh, do um all right 
So roles, this is where we start getting a little bit more complex roles. It caps the electric roles that can be shared and reused between teams. One of the cool things that Ansible's great at is bringing teams together. So if you have a network team, a Windows team, a Linux team, a networking team, a storage team, right? Which is a lot of the way that large IT organizations might be organized. You can sit there and create roles. And that allows each team to contribute their own Ansible playbooks that get grouped together into a role. And what we do inside the role is we call the different playbooks and we say, okay, install Apache, turn on the service, install Internet Explorer, whatever that thing is, it's called in Windows now, Firefox. Um, <laughs> um, the networking team might be configure a switch, you know, or, or configure the enterprise firewall to allow for Avian to the new the new server, right? And what we do is each team can write their own, kind of put their, their expertise into a playbook of how to do a list of tasks that would allow us to bring the web server onto the network. When you sit there and run the playbook, it'll provision the server, it'll configure the server, it'll configure the switch, it'll configure the storage, it'll do everything that's needed to put that on. So instead of having to get everybody in the room and have everybody agree, hey, this is what we all need to do, and then everybody go, well, yeah, I know it's my turn to do my task, but I'm busy. We got this uh, outage over here that I have to pay attention to. So your, your web server is going to have to wait. Um, we can just automate all of that as a role and, and push out a much larger, much more complex um, yeah. automation. Yeah. The way I look at roles is it's reusable. Right? It's like a sub uh, routine that you can keep using in different projects. Over and over again, different contexts. So you define the thing once. And yeah. so let's say in this case, I need a web server, but I made it very different web server configurations, but installing it is the same thing. So I have a role that sets it up, and then I might have another one that configures it per specific use case. Yeah. Nothing those are reusable. Okay. Yeah. But it's kind of like that's pretty expertise built into a playbook. All right. So plays and playbooks. Plays apply to roles for or tasks to manage nodes. A playbook is valid contains one or more plays, so we can target different roles and tasks at different groups of managed nodes. So uh, we can see here our playbook is called Dev Website. Our task is to create a virtual machine in EC2. And then um, on the EC2, so that's, at, and it's interesting because whoever wrote this slide deck uh, kind of lists where that role is being run from. So here's being run on local hosts. So local, my local laptop would reach out to Amazon and run, you know, talk to Amazon to create a virtual machine. Um, the next two, Linux Harden and the web server, um, are run on EC2 node, right? So now the node is set up to be in the setup and we run the playbooks locally there um, to deploy the virtual machine yeah, yeah. and harden the operating system. Yeah. So you can specify that in the playbook as far as where it runs. Um, can you define, so I guess my question is, I'm talking about support of Ansible and target operating systems and or devices. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Ansible has a lot of stuff built into it for specific devices. But let's say something isn't. But you do you have but you do have something like, I don't know, um, an API that you can, yep. you can use. Could you could you build, could you like for instance, I manage uh, 85 Cisco VPC systems at the world. It's already there. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I can look for. I can look for. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't find anything specific to using Ansible because there are other products that just demands to manage. Well, so so there's, like, a, there's a humongous the ecosystem of yes. switch control systems on Ansible. Exactly one of these cases we will not get into today. Yeah, but I could. But I could. But I could. If I knew the, the API, you know, which is yep. a standard, standard, you know, you could, uh, make, uh, REST API yeah. type of thing. I could. You know, and I knew which API I want. Oh, yeah. I, can, I can build that. Mm -hmm. Make your modules anytime you want. Right? Okay. You can make your modules that are meant for local execution only, but you can also make modules that you want to run on the individual devices you're reaching on. Right? So if you had some, if it was capability to run Python on any of your network equipment, 
then you can make a module that calls the local thing on those, and it would just basically pass out that module as it would dope and anything else. And one thing that we see from a lot of people are just getting started with Ansible is they discover like for Linux is the best one to call command, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what the command module does is it runs commands, right? So instead of using modules that are designed to do things like the installer package or control a service, they're like command module. You know, start the service. You know, the CTL. Yeah. Well, the problem is at that point you're just writing bash scripts. So yeah, they did was they took the batch the batch script and they put it into the command module line by line. Yeah. So don't do that. Explore the modules. Um well, just write a bash script. If that's no, all you need, yeah, then write your bash script, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a way that you can, you know. I'm sure there's no way. Uh, yes, incognito or something. Yep. That's my job. I'm just going to make sure you're doing your job. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was late. I overslept. Oh, no worries. Uh, hey, I'm we thought we were going to be the I'm, only ones today. I, my, my work gave me the day off yesterday, but then my wife handed me off to do I know the feeling. So I, I Trust me, my Monday is not off. I did right, get warning so, though. This is what happens when you have time to prepare. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, what? Definitely don't have this set up right. You, know, you don't have packets get done? Literally stole. That's already here. That's the word that I first got copy. At work, we're in the process of switching stuff over from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8. And uh, the company decided not to support Chef. So we have all these systems that deployment and build is all like, you know, based around Chef cookbooks. So now we have to like, Convert them over to Ansible, so that this uh, meeting is perfect time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a puppet, that's a chef. I mean, this when you get old enough, you keep right. seeing the same thing happening over and over again. You know, the next cool and, uh, automation tool. So inside of Ansible, there's a thing oh, called Ansible Doc, and when you type Ansible Doc, it will show you every module that's available on the on the system. So even though I just installed Ansible, you can see that there's a a uh, ton of stuff in here. It shows the internal ones. Yeah, shows all the internal ones. Before you go just on Peter's point, my only concern is that, and you know, you've been around longer than I have, but it seems like over time what we, what we keep on doing is layering more automation tools on top of automation tools. You know, and you know, it's like, why? Yeah, I mean, I understand someone wanted to do something a different way, but why? Well, let me let go, go find off back in history before we had a compiler and tell me how you would set up a computer. Right? I mean, everything we build on built on something else. We stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And I don't see automation being an exception to that. Now, the technology behind it changes, the, some of the ideas changes, but with Chef, it was all about a matter of everything calling into a central place. Ansible's idea is completely opposite, right? That you have the individual nodes not be aware that they've been managed, but they're controlled by one or more execution nodes out there that are responsible for setting them up. It's a different philosophy, but yeah, it's an automation tool. Uh, although Puppet, Chef, and Ansible don't share anything to one another. I mean, I think Puppet is still Ruby, if I remember right, and Chef was Ruby too, I think. Ruby or I can't remember. I mean, they even have different language backgrounds. So it's the fact that it's agentless, like make it easier. Yeah. I I know the Red Hat answer to that, right? The, it, so here here's the here's the challenge I have. Right? Imagine you have a thousand machines you need to manage. How well do you think you're going to manage those agents on those thousand boxes? Right. So a lot of people have done this in Windows and Linux before, but they had to run some kind of an agent to collect a list of all the software packages that were installed across all of those machines in the environment. And you know, they get these crazy reports back of like, 
you know, out of 500 machines, we're seeing, you know, 490 that have, you know, some certain software package that's supposed to be installed and the machine installed. So what are the 10 that don't have it? Um, it's really hard to, one, install agents on every system, and then two, make sure that the agents work properly for that. So by going with an agentless approach, where we're just using the remote management capabilities of each system, yeah. we don't have to worry about it. Well, Windows is always going to have WinRM available, and Linux is always going to have SSH available, and Cisco routers are always going to have their Telnet and iOS control. So the problem I have with, with from a from is this is but what Tay is saying is I mean I I dealt with thousands of machines. It is a mess to manage agents, but SSH is an agent too. The, the, whole, the, whole, the whole point here is that they may call it agent less, but in order for you to connect to the box, something has to be running. Yeah, you still have to have that service. So you still, exactly, you still have to manage that. I'm just saying, based on a ubiquitous Yeah, you're saying we need to do Well, it may be, but that SSH agent can absolutely still not work, like not getting the right keys on there. Uh, the, you know, the internal firewall for some reason don't have it, or even the service not running, and you can't update the damn thing. Right? Yeah. So, I, I'm all, I, it's totally true. I have dealt with thousands of boxes with agents that kept falling down because idiots logged on and killed my agents. That said, I don't, if I have a thousand boxes with SSH agents on them, uh, I can almost guarantee you someone's going to mess with them unless I've control over them. But, because it's future way too much. <laughs> well, there is that, right? But anyway, there is a All lot right. of thought process. You can lock it down, but it is not impossible to, to, to get rid of that. Now, is it easier than dealing with a real agent from like a puppet agent or stuff like that? Yes. Still got right. an agent. So we saw the Ansible document. You can do it with just so the dash L, which is this. Um, it shows us all built in Ansible modules, right? Uh, down at the bottom, they have the Ansible built in Yum module. So if I do something like Ansible doc and I enter that module name, now I get documentation specific to that module. So I can see here that, um, what was it? So right here, this is really important. The equal sign is mandatory. Okay, so if you see a dash, that means it's not mandatory. But if you see an equal sign, it is mandatory. Ask the parameter, ask to be specified when you use the module. So we can do allow downgrade, we can do auto remove, we can do bug fix, cache only, comp files. If you know YAM, these should be very familiar options. Right? Yeah, these should all be things that you've seen, probably seen on the command line when you're using YAM. And when we get down to the bottom, as you can see, it's just a huge list uh, yeah, state, state of parameters. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah, I, I'm not completely ignorant about this. I, you know, I just assumed because I had never looked at the Ansible that it was like puppet, and we have it all the time, but it's not. So, right. like, so basically, I'm on my MacBook Pro. I can install Ansible yep. using Homebrew, and I could, yep. I can use that to do a bunch of stuff. As long as your machine can run Python three, you're fine. Okay. okay. This or you is, can use and, and SSH. You mean it's going to need SSH? Nope. Yes, this yeah, is the, it uh, can do it. SSH. Well, SSH is one way, but it doesn't have to have keys. And you can get around it to the other ways of, of, of intersect. But default is SSH. Absolutely. This is the, um, the, the command module that I mentioned a lot. A lot of people, even when they first time with Ansible, they love the command module. Um, so you can see that the, here's, here's some examples. So name, return, message of the day to register var, uh, Ansible built in command cat, Etsy message of the day, register. My message of the day. So the register uh, line, what that does is just registers it, grabs whatever the output is of this command, and puts it into a variable. Um, so here they're writing a command that path database does not exist. Um, so here they're creating a path to, to, uh, to the database. And you, so you can kind of see how that runs, how that works, right? We're, we run a command, and then we're able to give it additional arguments to do things. 
But a lot of people, when they're first getting started with basketball, they fall in love with the fan logic because they can just take their bash scripts and just be like, one play after another is a separate line of another bash script. And they love it. Could someone tell me what the danger is here? What happens if I run this twice? It, exactly. Now, all of a sudden, my bash script has to have advanced logic in it to figure out should I do this or not. This is what you're saying. The better, if there's a module, you should be using the module. Not like yes. What Ansible tries to, when Ansible runs, it becomes a state machine. So, whenever it is told to do something, the first thing it does is look at what is the current state of the thing I'm looking at. And then from there, it figures out what to do based on what you want it to become. And if it sees, oh, well, this is exactly what it's supposed to be, it goes, oh, I'm skipping this step. I'm all, it's already done. Just out of curiosity, what are the Ansible modules for Python? Python. Okay, so if you're, yeah, Python, right? Python. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, it's you know, all the SDKs and all that stuff is online. Actually, if you don't need to follow, I'm definitely not a Python fanatic and all that, but you know, it's fairly straightforward, particularly if you already have a, what do you do right now? This is a super question. Well, I was now also I'm coding in Java. I also have a So it, but it's, it, there was a, we didn't get into that, but there was a, a post, was it six months ago, where someone did a simple count to a couple hundred billion or 300, a very large number, yeah. both in C and in, in Python. And compare the result. Like Python was like half a minute on it. C plus plus was about two milliseconds yeah, on it. Yes, I can because so this is, with this stuff here, you're running a ton of Python. Yeah, 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 this yeah, is not going to be fast. Hey guys, we're, we're in our first playbook now. Sorry about triplets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is. This is the, uh, the one for users, right? This is the user and the module. So this is used to manage user accounts and user attributes. For Windows targets, you use the Ansible Windows Win user. Well, it tells you right there that this is more of a Linuxy kind of module, um, and that Windows has a different user management thing. Um, but again, same same thing. Options equals mandatory. If we come down, we will see that name is. Probably the only mandatory field in here. So you have to give your user a name. Yeah, when you're writing your playbooks, you're doing all this. Obviously, you can do it all. You know, yep. you all the check centers, any Nats if you want, <laughs> for VI, but, for VM, but, but I mean, I'm assuming there are Ansible management GUI utilities you could use too to do all yes. that as well. Yeah. The IDE is to help you do anything, right? But it is. You know, you have a metadata file, file that you set up with your with your in front of your Python that defines all of those parameters. And then there's also Ansible Galaxy, which is a place where you can go if you are looking for something that is not built in, right? Those are all the built-in ones that come with Ansible Core, like Docker, aka yeah. yeah. Let's do Docker, okay? So that's what I found out. Is there somewhere search? But instead of Docker, since we're like Doing something cool, we'll do Podman. I prefer Podman. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so you can see that there's there's Podman modules. Um, what you want to do though is you want to look at who created the different things. You can see the installation command if you want to add that. Um, we'll go ahead and copy it. Um, and you can have private registries like this too. So if you are you know, you have an organization where you may have your own stuff that you don't want to share, or you want to lock certain versions in. You can just point everyone to your private ones. How do you include this? Like, if you had a repository, think you're talking about your Ansible scripts. How would you include a community, like Ansible Galaxy, as a uh, like dependency? Now we get into the automation platforms, right? So that's what they are basically built around. That you start with a Git repo, and you say, "This is my repo." <laughs> and Able, you can keep an eye on pushers and stuff like that, and be able to do tasks that it sees that's been updated. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, the the thing that you want to pay attention to, like this one says right here, right? You don't want to come from Joe's garage, right? Because I like Joe. Yeah, <laughs> read the source too. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can look and see where it's coming from, right? 
And so we know we know this one here is fairly safe. I copied the install command before. Um, I'm going to come here and see it again. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just moving the window off GitHub. <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't know what it's doing. I just straightened it for us. Oh, yeah. You want to be on my good side? Don't do that. <laughs> Sorry, don't do what? Don't do a curl pipe straight into bash. Okay, so when I do that, you can see it pulls in. Give it better. It pulls in the pop 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 and stuff. So I do ansible doc dash l. Well, this time wrap for pop man. No, you can put that after. That's okay. So that's okay. Um, you can see all the pop man stuff. Right, so I have a bunch of modules that I can use if I want to manage Popman containers with Ansible. So it's pretty easy to extend what Ansible can do beyond what it comes with with built-in modules. And, and you might already find the module that you want to think that it needs to be customized out there. There's a billion of them. See, that makes me appreciate they're going to make the fully qualified domain required because that's very redundant. Yep. Yeah, like they're namespacing their namespace. Exactly. Yeah. Because you could have containers dot docker, right? Right. You could have containers dot docker. You could have containers dot whatever. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty awesome since they went that way. A couple of years ago, it was still a mess, right? There, there was no name spacing going on, and um, the module names it was just it was just like crazy uh, trying to find stuff. So this makes it a lot easier. Um, so anyway, back to the slide deck. I think back to red and playbooks. There long <laughs> enough. Yeah, back to back to writing our first playbook. We're getting really close to writing our third playbook. Um, all right, inventories. This is hugely, hugely important. Ansible doesn't work without an inventory. So for Ansible to work effectively, it, it will, but if you're going to write your first playbook, you need an inventory. Um, people love readers. Um, <laughs> all right, so inventories. This is why what I they here. do is they are a list of, if you're running it in a larger environment, right? You can run, yes, you can run Ansible playbooks without an inventory. But if you're going to be using this, you know, to manage machines, you will want to have an inventory. Inventories can be dynamic or they can be kind of manually maintained. Obviously, dynamic is easier. If it's a dynamic uh, playbook, it will come out of your AWS account where you it can pull a list of all the virtual machines you have in AWS. Um, if you have satellite server or some other system management server, um, such as VMware, you can pull the number of hosts out of those environments as well, and it'll automatically generate your inventory file for you. If you just want to do it manually, you can enter the FQDN in the um, in the in the list. And if you want to use groups, because we can't sit there and say, hey, Ansible, run this on a group of machines, instead of having to say, run this on everything that's, that's in our inventory. Because we can see we have three different things here. We have a web server, database, and a router, right? And then down below it says production, website, database, Cisco IOS, it's router. So we can sit there and call to um, prod and then we'll run things in the production environment. So we don't have to sit there and say, run this on Missiles and missiles and missiles. We can instead specify a group of those to run on. Yes. So, in, as this is laid out, if I run against Cisco IOS or against Pod, I get a subset. I mean, I can run against all, which. Yep. In order to hit everything with all, do you need the comprehensive list at the top, or does all automatically hit everything in the bottom? Better. So you can actually go in and make this a little, a little more fun. You can start saying these are children of that. So you can make it a hierarchical, which is why this format is going away and being replaced with this one. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but now you can actually, so you can have here my web production server, oh, my web servers, but here's my web production, web development, and on production, you may have my web with PHP, my web with Google, whatever, and you can start making it down, but if you go in and say I want to update all my web servers, it will automatically take all the children. Just curious, if you have like you have let's say functional, you know, to web dev prod, uh database web uh dev prod. If I want to do all my prods and I use like wildcard colon prod, 
I haven't seen that happen. I think it's yeah. pretty uh, yeah, dumb yeah, in that yeah, sense. You have, you but you can organize it so in, in any way you want. Right? So, if, for instance, you're doing dynamic, you can use a label on the machines on, let's say, in, in AWS, and all you're basically saying is anything that matches this label, mm -hmm. and it will grab whatever whatever organization you have. So, if you know you're going to do those kind of runs, plan ahead, organize the data so it fits your use case. Yeah. So, Pemetera has a good question. Does you know, you can have, um, for example, even though I have a website in production already, I could create another group and just call it web servers and have website lists done for there as well. So when it comes to the grouping, you can have the same name in multiple groups. You can also have groups that are going to groups and have that work for it. So, so, so you may have, let's say, you're setting up boxes for the first time. So you have a lot of standard Linux tasks, but you also have then you want to specialize them. And then so you can run the general ones on everything, but only run the specialized one on the ones that deal with those. Now we're getting into a little more complex playbooks and all that stuff. Another way to skin that cat is to have two playbooks. Right? Okay. One that does the basic Linux, and then you want an all one just for the web service. But you know, there's lots of ways to get into this. Yep. All right. All right. So some of the other things Ansible can do. The automation controller, also known as AWX. Does have a way that if it's mainly books for centralized management, I was getting into what the picture does. Uh, so you can manage projects, parameters, inventories, role based access controls come with that. So if you want to make it to where your web server team can only see the light web server by your database team, um, you can set role based access controls and say you can edit your own playbooks, you can edit ones in your group, but you can see the ones from the other groups. Um, so you can do all kinds of crazy permissions like that. And integrates with other IP tools or APIs and notifications such as Slack, PagerDuty, WebHook, things like that. So, um, what is really cool there? Um, one of the most popular things we've seen is like is the integration with um, ServiceNow because it can use that a lot. Technique. So, um, ServiceNow, it comes in. It can call an Ansible playbook. Ansible playbook runs. Pushes the result of the playbook run back to the service now, saying, Hey, I've remediated on my own. This is what I got. Um, at Red Hat Summit, we announced event driven Ansible for EBA. Sometimes we're event driven as EBA. But what it um, does is there are several different ways to um, make it to where Ansible can monitor things that are going on. So you can subscribe to Ansible to, let's say, a contest screen, an event screen. And it'll look for certain entries. If it sees something, it will kick off an automation play. Um, that automation play, this is what we call our, our uh, uh, workflow editor. So you can add different roles, different playbooks into a workflow. And you can say, okay, I just got this playbook kicked off. The first thing I'm going to do is open a ticket with service now. And I'm going to log into all the web servers and try to update a setting. Um, Reboot web service if the web page is accessible, if the web page is successful or not. I'm going to update the service now ticket that I opened previously. If everything is able to be, if the web service is responding, I'm going to go ahead and close the ticket. Right? Um, all based off of Ansible receiving a message saying the web service are inaccessible. Right? So you can go and have Ansible completely automate the entire job list. Open a ticket. Try to resolve the issue, maybe you just restart the service. Try to access the web page, it looks like it comes up. Cool. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? Because if you're running a uh, help desk and you're grading down how fast tickets are closed, Ansible will just close the ticket in like two minutes for you. Um, it lowers your time. Um, but there's, there's all kinds of cool functionality built into the automation controller. That's AWX. I'm not sure if a lab exposes us to AWX or not. I don't think it does. Um, but if it, if not, and you're really interested in the Ansible, AWX is definitely worth looking at. Um, the Red Hat productized version of AWX is called Ansible Control. And then also there is the Automation Controller, which is um, more of a security focused part of Ansible. Um, integrates with enterprise directories for granular based access controls, credential management. Um, that includes um, SSH keys, encryption streams, API tokens, things like that. 
but we're able to keep those in a vault so they're not easily um, seen outside of the Ansible environment. So if you provide like a token, we're going to encrypt it and then store it. Um, and it, it has to be decrypted uh, to be able to be seen. And then um, job history. If you, when you run an Ansible play with it, you can see this in the lab. Um, when it returns, it'll return the results of the playbook to standard out, right, to the screen. You can push that over to a file if you want to, um, but once it's run, it's gone. There's no recorded history of what happened. A lot of times we want to see what happens on repeated runs over time, right, of what happened. It was, my playbook was running great, and then someone updated a package, and now my playbook doesn't run anymore. Well, something changed, it might be time to update the playbook. Other times, some other setting might be different because of the playbook task mission. So we'd like to go back and see what the history is of a certain playbook we run so that we can maybe help troubleshoot when it doesn't. Um, the Ansible controller maintains the output of each playbook run against um, for every job throughout the history of that job we run. Yeah. So one issue I've seen when viewing the history of the job often is Standard out is basically unreadable because there's no new lines and stuff like that. Is that something? It, for one, is there a way to fix yeah. that for standard out, or is that in that for you? Yeah, they fix it. There should it should be. Okay, maybe I'm just thinking. Standard there. standard tasks. Basically, every time it runs a task, it should be a headline for the task name followed by. Yeah, I mean, if there's an error and it puts the result. The, so that depends the on where. Like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, where the like the right. so that, error. Yeah, it's like a key value. Yeah, no, it's like that. Yeah, so they, yeah, yeah. They, that depends on what you are getting the error from. Right. If if it is a Python, you, you might get I me. Mean, you get a stack dump at worst. So there's not really. Anything to do. But if it's an expression that is nested and nested, yeah, you may get one humongous block of text. Uh, you should be able to in the GUI to tell it to wrap lines, but it's still one block of text, right? Yeah. So I usually just copy you know, it out. Yeah. Binary. Yeah, I mean, hooray for computer error messages, because that's part of what we've been living with for ages. But, you know, when you have, think about how you do an exception handling in code. How would you know how to split it? Because, you know, each exception handler doesn't really know what the other guys did. So you kind of like, how do I create something? Unless you create an internal structure and then depend on something else being able to read that and make some decisions. And what happens if that fails? I mean, if you're not getting the error messages. <laughs> yeah. So there is a lab set up for, for everybody. It runs all the time. You have to be yelling at it to run it you want. Um, but redhat.com, it, it's easier. I'll show you how to get to it. It's using the Ansible website. Do you have a link to this presentation? To the, the presentation? Yeah, the presentation. I'll, I'll upload it later. Yeah. Okay. I, I just I just edited one of the Red Hat default presentations. So I haven't saved it in there yet. Um, so it, to get to those labs that were, I don't know how to talk to this. It's like this. Okay, so you just go to ansible.com. Um, right at the top of the page is a link. Or I'm not seeing the screen update here on the it's not updated. Yeah. But I'm not seeing that on here. I'm still seeing your um, a galaxy screen. Okay, I see it now. Uh, it's yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it's just going really slow. Um so up here on this tab it says learn and then Click get started. There's a ton of ways to, to learn. You can also just go to Interactive Labs, I guess. Um, but under Interactive Labs, uh, don't go, don't click the Interactive Labs thing. Um, so under under Learn, click Get Started, and then from Get Started, click on Self-Paced Labs, and what you'll see is a whole slew of uh, Ansible learning resources, different labs you can do. So everything from uh, network automation, because we've mentioned very briefly how you can 
uh, worked with things like Juniper OS, Cisco, things like that. Um, and started with Ansible Builder, learned how to create custom execution environments. The way Ansible executes play playbooks and roles in its fruit state is it used to just use SSH to go in and, and talk to everybody's box remotely. Um, and we report SSH dozens of times. And you know, something happened and the SSH even itself died, all of those forks of SSH died as well. So big problem there, right? Um, because everything's still tied back to a single DNA that we forked it a bunch of times. Um, the new way that we that we run plays, we call them execution environments. They're actually containers. So we spin up a container with SSH, it does its thing, we delete the container. If we need 20 containers running SSH to do operations on 20 machines at once, we spin up 20 containers that have nothing in them except for the SSH to when we shut them down. What? No? <laughs> It's not job by job, but I mean, it's so, it's a pool of jobs. But you know, the idea is if you have a thousand jobs to do, putting that to a single thread, done. So yeah. string that all on, let's say, ten yeah. or hundred threads. All of a sudden, now you can execute a lot of it in parallel. But each of those job execution boxes have a series of tasks they have to execute before they terminate. But I mean, yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. say the same. They're all in a simple and temporary environment. And yeah, Combined to the resources on your on your Ansible host. Yep. Right, if your Ansible host can only run twenty containers um, because that's how much how many resources that that's how many it will run. But Ansible will try to run up to the amount of resources that it right. But a lot of your tasks are sequentially dependent on each other. Yeah. Right? So a playbook basically is a sequence of tasks, uh, and they have want, to be executed in that sequence. If you want to do something more advanced, we have. Um, when you start with the event driven Ansible, which was announced at that summit, um, so we already got something here. You can start looking at it. it tells you the amount of time that each of the labs takes. So write your first playbook is the one that I have on the link on the screen for. And if we bring that one up, it brings us to the screen. Write your first playbook. Woo. Click launch. Ansible works against multiple nodes or hosts, and you're going to start with the same way of listing group of lists known as an inventory. First challenge, we're going to create an inventory to be used in a challenge. And you can see it says down here that um, things the are some tea break. Yep. Things are slow for me right now. So it might be better if I came over here and just clicked it again. Wow. Oh. It's quite neat. So, you know, yeah, this so is a, it's still loading. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it, it might be better to do this at home where you're not on the Lightrace right network. Um, yeah. it's well, so, so here's it loads before yeah. we, before here's we the challenge, right? Ansible manages computers, basically, all iOS, you know, networking equipment. Anyway, everything has a process on it. In order for any of this to make any sense, you need something running. And that's what it's doing. It's trying to create a couple of targets that you can hit with your Ansible so you can actually see it work. Uh, Ansible itself, it's a pip install. And it's not going to take that long to install. But this is what literally what Instruct does. It sets up a simulated environment that allows you to run Ansible against an actual real host with an IP address and SSH. So you can actually see it work. And that's what takes time. And hence, the more people who does this, Usually, the slow one gets. Right? I mean, there's a someone gets a bill out of it because it's cloud resources being provisioned. Yeah. But if you go, if you start it here and you go home, trust me, it's gone. It doesn't stay out. If you don't touch this for a while, it will kill it. Yeah, it goes to sleep and then it has, it takes long to fill the files. Right. Like that. So you can see right now, it's saying the hamster is trying to break, probably an inch pixel, yeah. but it has some people in it to get down the bottom. Um, but what's really cool is it gives you kind of an update using these buttons down here at the bottom of the screen. You can see those are kind of small. Um, it gives you an overview of kind of what you're going to be doing. So, this first thing it does is we're going to 
Right, the inventory can be used in the following challenges. Um, the inventory tells what nodes are out there to be used by Ansible, what credentials need to be used to connect to them, and how nodes are grouped and other necessary variables. That you can put variables into your configuration file. You can put a different passwords for different nodes, things like that. And then um, here's an example inventory. So um, we can see things like at the so here we have um, all variables, Ansible user equals rel, Ansible password equals something, something, Ansible port equals 22. You probably don't want to put 20 password in the file. Instead, use AWX security default. Um, we have web, we have web server one, web server two, that's cool. And then under DB, we can see that we actually pass along an IP address. And that may be because the uh, DB1 and DB2 are either not in DNS or they're using a separate network interface for administrative tasks. And that query command, SQL query commands are coming into one interface. That's going to be very restrictive of what kind of connections it accepts. But then SSH is coming in on a different um, interface uh, for management. So uh, in that case, we're specifying the IP address of what else that we actually Okay, so those are the types of variables that you can put into an inventory to, you know, address any kind of complexities that you have in your network. And now we have 50 seconds left. Um, so while we have 50 seconds, what I need everybody to do is we have. Um, I'll pull it up. Some other screen. All right. Um, yeah, you had meeting topics. I saw it. That was in the middle. Of All right. Let me find this real quick. Want me to share with you then? Sure it does. All right. So these are the topics that we had for. Uh, 2023. And uh, as you can see, we are kind of at the end of our list of topics for the year. Yep. So um, next month in June, we have Peter doing IoT, how to IoT with Linux. Uh, Tim, yeah, you're slated to do Kubernetes primer. Still good with that? Yeah. Move as zero tier to September. All right. So we still need that slide. One, yeah, we canceled last month, unfortunately. One topic for October. And then we don't meet November and December because of the holidays. Right. Um, so if something, if uh, Peter, Tim, and Doug, if you guys can send them like a, a Synopsis what it is. You're the only use chat GPT to come up with for you. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, then you guys have to buy for what chat GPT. Yeah, says. that's right. Um, but if somebody wants to take on October, that would be reasonable. So give us some thought. And Doug, you know, well, you don't I have to do them back to back if I you want. I might be able to move that to October. Want to do this one October? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking so you don't have it back to back. All right, so now we need somebody who wants to do September. So, so is, and, there and is, it, is there something interesting that you want to talk about? Yeah, I would like to do I like to build Yeah. You can't do world peace with Emacs or something like that? I don't want to always do Emacs. Okay. I love it. All right, so back to our demo. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that one I said big no to when I saw it. But I'm not in my ID, I'm just going to do it. All right, so I used a few. Yes, as, as you guys can see, Wait, uh, you, this binding in Emacs? Yeah, it's very popular. You can actually also do Emacs key binding in, in them. You can also yeah, that's, that's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the key binding, boot key binding, and drop. Yeah, so, 
So think about it for now. Think about the way you might want to do it. But we are looking for a speaker now for September and the topic. Yep. If you already have a topic for June, July, August, or October, well, I guess not October, but June, July, or August, send me like a quick little abstract where you can talk about. I have to update the library so that they can update their Facebook pages yep. and whatnot. Write us a list of topics you want to hear about because I think we need to put stuff on for next year some so we can get a, you know to, to test point get some of that started sooner than later. Yeah. Even if you can't talk about it, if there's stuff we go, this is mystery or whatever, all I mean I will not even if you think, hey, I'm just beginning on this thing called bash as an example. Um, getting some fresh perspective of something you know is actually a lot more interesting often than hearing a deep dive and stuff you already know about. Well, I don't think I'm going to that's why I read the Bible because it's not that much to do with the Bible. Right. Well, it's but, but depending like, on your life. Like another thing I could do next year, which I was thinking about exploring, is you know, just a really quick hit on using time shares. You know, uh, you know, creating snapshots, you know, on paramedics. How would you recover? You know, right. Well, and practice. so you want to write it up, Ted, or you want me to write it up? Or? Yeah, if you can. Yeah. Uh, I'm still in this. All right. So, um, this is Ansible Navigator, okay? What what the uh, what our lab initially shows is is Ansible Navigator. I did something to change the screen. Now I can't get it back. Um, whatever. Um, and so it tells you, hey, ask my time to complete this section in three minutes. We're gonna write first Ansible quick on challenges and tasks or what you're gonna do. Um, so the first one, Ansible Navigator is a command, uh, command based tool for creating, review, and troubleshooting Ansible content. Really cool. And then Bond Chan just use the Ansible Navigator to find Ansible playbooks. All right, that's task one. Just read all that. Task two, the editor tab is open by default. So this is our editor. And you'll see a folder labeled Ansible Files. Yep, there it is right there. Uh, this folder will contain our inventory file and future playbooks. Currently, one file residing is called um, Ansible Navigator YAML. Ansible, Ansible Navigator YAML file contains all the things properly run this lab. Here's the contents of that file in case we want to look at them. So, um, and there goes my colors. It, as you can see, it is, um, it sets an execution environment, use the service now. Latest environment, um, and then it's saying pull if it's missing. Um, playbook artifacts save as artifact name.json. So, okay, that's cool. We don't want to edit that file. Um, but what we want to do is within the editor, open the directory, Ansible files, and if I right click, we create a file called host. So, we're already in Ansible files. So I'm just going to right click new file, call it host. And boom, here it is. And it's an empty file now. So then if I'll go supply the following content, you can hit the little box or copy. And when you come up here, you can right click and paste. What are you on the way with? Actually, uh, this is a browser problem. Uh, a lot of these uh, Guys, what they use is iframes. Control uh, it's not going to allow <laughs> to work. Uh, but a lot of them, when you click on it, they try to directly paste into an out frame, which the browser no longer allows by default. Yep. Okay. But Control V works. So use Control V. Um, and then task number three how to use the Ansible Navigator. Ansible Navigator comes with interactive mode by default that allows you to use four different options within this lab. Um, we test Ansible Navigator to standard output. So um, what you can see here is under the control tab, um, we can see these two Ansible files. And inside of Ansible files, there's host. If you add out the host file, um, we can see that that is the same file that we just created. I did hit enter after node two, which is why my prompt ends up on the same line. Okay, so if I go back into the editor and I do hit enter here, I go back. Oh, we want to save it. Um, so that's kind of the crazy thing here. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> it, don't 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 make any mistakes then. Every time you make a change, instruct saves it for you. So if you make a mistake and you save it, then you just it saves it. 
It's kind of crazy. Um, so we can do um, Ansible inventory or Ansible no, navigator. Ansible navigator inventory dash dash list. list. And remember, we had that policy that said if the Quay service now execution environment was missing, go ahead and pull it. It's going down that service now execution environment. It's going to be done here soon. I know it will. All right, so when I pull it down, now I get the JSON output of my inventory file. So that's um, actually, yeah, so here's my inventory file. Okay. See, oh, so this is JSON. So YAML, JSON. The format you're seeing is a legacy. It still works. I don't think they're going to throw it out anytime soon. There's tons of code made by that. But this is the structure that is a lot more flexible for you know, nesting, and, and it's a lot easier to see do it that way. But it is, oh, I hate this, but I mean, it's JSON or YAML, depending on what. It's the dash 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 return to YAML yeah, you can give it a yeah, as long as the structure is like you have your host and all that stuff. But it, yeah, but you can see, I always see they always mention that's what the server does, but I'm seeing all these YAML files. So, the, so, YAML doesn't have a strict mode, at least that I'm aware of. But literally, if you go to the parser, it will indicate that as an error, but it will then try again and say, oh, let me just assume it's there, yeah. uh, which is dangerous. But that's what they do. They get by it even though it's an error. So I try it, YAML lint and see what happens. So, and then it also says you can use uh, inventory dash dash graph to show a more condensed version mm -hmm. of that. So that's what it looks like yep. dash graph. And then when you're done with the module, you just hit the check command, the check button. And if everything is good, it says well done, loading and doing next challenge. And now we get to the next thing and it says loading a copy. We can go through here to see what's going to have us do. Looks great. Um, let's start. And now we get to create um, the editor tabs open by default within the editor tab, open the directory, and create apache.yaml. So, new file, apache.yaml. My blank file. Uh, the editor tab is open by default within the Apache YAML file. It's applied the following content. Notice it's got the three dashes here, uh, dash, 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 and then there's a line. Which I just mentioned. Yeah. 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 If someone gives you some dash, dash, dash. Okay. Was it, it, like it, it's still network. the correct format, but a lot of things will ignore it. We'll just specify that as a YAML format. It's like a mining coding. So, so I work for Avo, which you know is not part of Yahoo, but there's like in working with the Yahoo stuff, they they, they use Y everywhere. And so until recently, I just assumed YAML files were another Yahoo proprietary thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, what, does that's that that's that's where Y. Yeah, another marketplace. Yeah, there we go. So? Yeah, another markup language. Yeah, that's what YAML stands for. Yeah, there's also another markup. There's also PLML files that we use sometimes for some of our stuff, but I forgot what PLML stands for. It's like um, top of this markup language or something like that. Oh, what? Are the inventory files the problem? Um, or at least the old ones. But it might be. I don't know. I don't know. You can yeah. say, but you know, they're the same with the. Yes, it is a standard. I and I file well, format. What this that, points to is how terrible that scenario is. Everyone has to go out and see. Well, no. so no. <laughs> yeah. so, so my uh, problem uh, is uh, that uh, I uh, see uh, YAML uh, and uh, JSON in particular are all going into what XML could do 20 years ago. Because this idea that it, it was too hard and too complex. Well, not only is that schema, but transformation. I mean, so I let's, let, okay, sorry. All right, so let's go over this really quick. <laughs> Let's go over this really quick. So our main Apache server install, right? Um, if anybody watched any of the cool stuff coming up with Red Hat's new Southern, uh, Red Hat introduced something called Lightspeed. 
um, which is uh, another kind of iteration of, of Ansible. And what Lightspeed does is uses some AI that was created between Red Hat and IBM, where it reads that line, Apache server installed. And all you do is you type in the line. And if you have Lightspeed speed enabled, once that line is typed in, it's going to look at it using the actual language processing out there like, they want to install Apache. And it will write the next couple of lines for you. So all you have to be able to do with Lightspeed enabled is describe what you want Ansible to do, and Lightspeed, which is Red Hat and IBM working together. Okay, when it's oh, chat, way, it's submitted chat GPT. Uh, it's, yeah, it's Watson, but yeah. Except it's, um, yeah, it's, it's Watson and not chat GPT. And it's, um, as Red Hat put it at Summit, it's curated and domain specific uh, language model. Yeah, so yeah, but still, you won't sit there and be able to type in name, take over the world, and have like AI it's drawn right. all about seven months. You know, do all that crazy stuff. We need um, all the Chinese servers out there. All right. <laughs> so further down, we see the line host, and it says node one. So we're just specifying a single node that we want this to run on, and then become true. Become is really special. What that does is, if there's a way of escalating privileges on the host that you are running the playbook on, become will run on a Linux box that will try to run sudo, and you, know, you want to set up a user that Ansible is using. You can log in. You should set up an Ansible user um, or some other unprivileged user for Ansible to use to log in. Add them to the wheel group so they have pseudo access. And then when it needs to run a privileged command, it'll automatically practice it with sudo. So you, what you're telling this playbook to do is go ahead and try to be try to run sudo. You could say become root, and then it will try to actually switch user. Root and get full group of privileges instead of just pseudo privileges. Um, mm. Pseudo privileges are, are better because you, you have more granular control over those, right? You can give different users access to different commands with pseudo, whereas root you would be able to Going back to what we talked about earlier about setting up a daemon, this is another step to that daemon or SSH or whatever configuration of the box have to fulfill for this to be successful. If you need to run things privileged, the user you're connecting to needs to be able to become privileged. If that does not face this will fit. So again, yes, it's demonless, but it still comes with a set of prereqs that you need. Now, if you do it right, it's not that hard to set up, but if you have a thousand boxes, there's a good chance you may not get it right every time. All right, so expanding up um, what we already have, now we have the word task up here. This is us saying, okay, here comes the list of things I want you to do with Ansible. So the first thing we're going to do is latest Apache version installed. This can use the, the uh, Ansible built-in package module. It's going to install the latest Apache server, just like we saw in our slides. All right? So question with state latest. Right now when you run it, if it's not installed, it's going to install the latest. The latest version. Sometime later, you run this again. If there is a newer version, it will auto update yep. versus just saying, hey, it's already installed. Yep. Right. Or you can go in and be more specific and say, I want to only have this yeah. version or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It, you, it, can, you can say present, yeah. which will use whatever version is present. If it's not there, it'll install whatever version is yeah. available. Um, if you want a specific version, you can write in state version. But this is the state machine that is in there. Or you can say absent, and guess what it then does? Deletes it, right? So yeah. it's all a matter of you stating, I need this state. Once this playbook is done, these are the states that I need active, or whether that is installed, uninstalled, at this version, this configuration file, et cetera, et cetera. And it will ensure that that's the case when it's done. Now, it will ignore everything else in the box, only what you have in your tasks. And okay, with that, so we're going to go on to the next challenge and uh, in the last challenge we created a, a playbook now it's time to launch it so we're going to use Ansible Navigator to launch it uh, during the task you'll be wondering how Ansible Navigator actually knows where to find the host file this is configured in the Ansible Navigator YAML which was provided earlier we looked at it we just have to not change anything which is good um, so that is that so we'll wait for our Interface come up. Here we go. It's going to 
drop us right into the main line. We lose our handful navigator in this particular challenge, but that's okay. Task one is to um, CD into Ansible files and then Ansible navigator run. Now, if I wasn't running Ansible navigator, I could just run Ansible run, right? But since we sub some variables through Ansible navigator, we're going to keep running this Ansible navigator command. And then Apache YAML. And after a little bit, we're going to start seeing some output. So gathering facts. What the gathering facts line does is actually Ansible goes out and tries to gather some information about the host that it's running against. So it's gathered some information on node one, what node one looks like, our software, software, operating system, all that kind of good stuff. Um, latest version installed, you can see it says it changed node one. So node one had something done onto it. And then it's recap node one, two things were okay. It changed one thing and then everything else was okay equal zero. So it was reachable, it didn't fail, it wasn't skipped. Wasn't rescued, and it wasn't right. Better. We're not going to get into the advanced stuff, but it, it's interesting if you read the other options, right? You can have error handling in here, you can say, Well, this failed, I want to try X on the number of time, or you can even say, This fails, run this stuff over here instead to try to recover it. So, there's all kinds of options of dealing with complex playbook issues that would I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's impossible to do in Bash, but it's hard. All right, so, the next thing it has us do is to ensure that Ansible is installed. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna run it straight up our Ansible command. We're gonna run on node one. The module we're gonna run is the shell command, right? Everybody's favorite command module is either command or shell. Shell works just like command. And we're going to run, our argument is rpm qi HTTPD. So if you're familiar with our command, we're just gonna run a query, which is dash q, I is see if it's installed Apache HTTP. And so we're going to see what Ansible returns here. And sure enough, it gives us all the information. Actually, no, I is information. If it is, if it is installed, it doesn't return any information about the package. So we query for information on that HTTP package. It returns a bunch of stuff, proving to us that Apache is indeed installed on top. Okay. Um, if you notice, that was kind of cool. I didn't have to run an SSH command to check that on my remote host. I let Ansible go ahead and run SSH for me and log into the box run command and get out All right, so pretty cool stuff. Um, Apache is installed. Well, earlier you had mentioned something I just you skipped over me. Uh, you talked about the password and things in the playbook. Uh, how would you do it if you wouldn't, if you're not going to do it that way? SSH keys or something? Yeah, use an SSH key. Yeah. Yeah. It is, and this is using keys. By default, yeah. it will yeah, want to not. Keys, so. yeah. yeah. But yeah. you can go and, so there's some tricks, right? Where would, you, where would you, where is the pass for this So if you're doing that, then you're using the SSH uh, add and the SSH agent on your yeah, local you can, box yeah. to open up your key. And then when you want Ansible, there's access to it. Right. So, okay. Yes. So if you have pass, so I would say for automation purposes, the passphrase and keys makes no sense. Rotation of keys often makes sense. Right? But the whole idea that you can't automate uh, your maintenance of the boxes because there has to be a human for, in front of it to type stuff just makes no sense. You can also use this as the vault. So you can store things in the vault that just re encrypt something that's already. Yeah, but not the SSH. And, and Store there. So, again, I, I thought you'd nope. use that. Just oh. data files. Oh, that's crazy. Um, um, well, so you can tell Ansible to want use a password lock I mean, right, literally, uh, instead of using the key, it goes in and says, here's the username, here's the password. And in that case, you can get the password from the wall. But that's pretty much it. Uh, you don't okay. want any passwords in the playbooks. You don't want them in clear text. That's what the wall deals with. And then we got this fancy word. Well, my home address is totally secure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have problems at work. I don't bother to see the problems at work. Best of me and that Ansible won't try changing things that are already correct. Right. So if we rerun our Ansible Navigator 
run Apache command a second time. We, we know Apache is installed. We verified that already. If we run this a second time, you'll see task place versions installed. Um, it says no one was okay. Um, it ran two tests, both were okay. But it's okay. It didn't find an error, but C just doesn't say change. I did not put change. It did not have to install Apache this time because it was already installed. Right, but he ran two tasks successfully. So just uh, going back to containers, to be honest, yeah, experience of the container system, and then just kind of playing around like you guys would do it every single day. But so, all right, so you're showing Ansible, you know, the connection to the machine, mm -hmm. manipulating that. So if I, if I wanted to manipulate a bunch of machine, a bunch of containers, I want to install HTTP on a bunch of containers on the machine with, I don't want to do that with Ansible. You know, and let's say all the machines are like, you know, all the Docker instances, I guess, I don't know, the network interfaces are such that, you know, you can't process it directly so, into the instance, into the Docker instances. How would you, how would you manage those documents? So, so here's, the here's the difference, right? This is, what we're looking at right now is a traditional Linux yeah. way of managing. It's not how we manage containers. Yeah. So you will use Ansible to do it with the container way, which means that you're changing the image in the sky. So if you're having Apache, a container, you're running 100 times with Apache on it somewhere, yeah. with one image. So what you would do is you will take the Docker file or whatever you're using to define that image. You will modify that with Ansible. You will tell Ansible to do the build command, and that could be on your local box or somewhere in the cloud, who knows. That produces an image that you then push up to the registry, and then you tell Ansible to go out and pull that down on all the, all the nodes that's running. Okay. Or tell them that's there. Now, if they're running something that keeps an eye on it, they might do it automatically, but that will be what Ansible does. It doesn't go in and try to modify, it can't, because containers are ephemeral. But it changes the definition, and then it will tell all the runtimes to go and pull down the newest version and switch all. Uh, and if you if you like Podman, there's a little auto update feature in Podman. So once you have it running, if you run that command, it will go out and look at the registry and say, "Oh, there's a new version," and it will literally download it and switch all. Just like it would be, it will there will be like a, a second maybe where it's still the old one, the new one comes up, but it will be pretty fast. But that's all Ansible does. I mean, Ansible is not a container at runtime. It just tells the engine what to do. <laughs> all right. So we, uh, at this point, we have created our web server. We make sure Apache is installed, right? But it's not running. It's not really doing anything. We just, we just have it installed, right? Um, so now we're going to do a couple more things. So the next task we're going to do is make sure that Apache is enabled and running. So I'm going to come over to my playbook. It's very important that we get the indentation correct. Yep. That looks good. If indentation is not correct, that's like the old adage that you can write a thousand lines of code or you know, a million lines of code. Spaces so, matter. Something home before you walk. <laughs> With uh, YAML, you can write a million lines of YAML and see the space before you walk. Mm. Those are not tabs, those are spaces. Do not use tabs in the YAML file. Um, that will mess you up bad. Um, those are spaces. Indentation by space, not that. That's two spaces. All right, so indentation has to be absolutely right, which is why I'm using the copy and paste feature. Um, all right, so this one, um, Apache enabled and running is the name of our task. We're going to use our built in service module, services, HTTPD. We're going to make sure that it's enabled and its state must be started by the time we're done. In other words, we're going to turn on enable and start the Apache service. Right. So we've updated our playbook. If we come back over here, and yes, Peter, I didn't have to type saved yet. Um, oh, you have to do a CD first. Yeah, CD, CD. That's not good. Um, Ansible files, and then Ansible navigator. I guess I should pick this. Okay, so what will happen when it gets to that line about Apache being installed? It should say it's okay, right? Um, so this Apache is installed, Apache enabled and running. It changed that, which means it wasn't running before, or it wasn't enabled before. Something was different, um, but it made the change and everything is good. If we want to verify, 
by the status of Apache. Um, now it's funny because Control V doesn't work in the command line part, but right click paste does. Um, kind of crazy. So we're going to run our service stacks and we're going to look for the Apache service and we're going to get four lines after that. Um, after we find HTTP service. So we're going to use that service stack. Remember I told you that it goes in and gathers maps about the system at the beginning of the play. So we're going to tell it to go in, gather facts again, and tell us which services are up and running. And then look for the Apache service. So we're going to run that. And there we go, HTTP service. It is um, controlled by system D. It is running and it is enabled. So it was able to, with the facts that it gathered about the system, it was able to give us some, some really clear, good information about the status of our Apache service. So that is doing what we wanted it to do now. It's enabled, it's running. Um, so we feel good about that and we can go on to our next challenge. Everyone noticing an interesting trait with Ansible. Input to it is YAML, output is very often JSON. That's just wrong. It, it's it's all. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it text? Is, is that well, so the yeah. difference with it is that JSON can actually be put on one line, whereas YAML. Yeah, uh, but no one can read JSON on one line. It is like a dangling Well, it, this is not for you to read. It's for the computer to read. Yeah, yeah. really great for yeah. Have you ever tried taking JSON data and converting it to a spreadsheet? It's awesome. So it's, <laughs> yeah. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the copy module and ask both to update to upload a web page. And I think this, this is probably going to be the last part that I do. And then, you know, if you want to keep going with this, uh, I showed you how to get to the, the lab that you did. That's quite a problem, but we're coming up on our 11 o'clock hour. So the editor tab is open by default, and the editor create a directory called files. So Ansible files will create a new folder called files. And then inside of files, um, that's really terrible, isn't it? So inside of files, um, it wants me to create a web HTML file. A file web .html. Oh, uh, what happens if it tries to no, register is with this file? It is it not it is it for this race to skip over? I'm sorry, can you repeat? If Ansible, if you have written the Ansible code, but the computer gets down for some reason, so just because it's graceful, it's keeping the errors in this. Well, I don't know what you mean by graceful. It will say I can't connect, but I mean, that's yeah. as graceful so as it basically gets. <laughs> it tries to connect a number of times and then it says unreachable. So in the results that we've been looking at, it would just say unreachable. Okay. Well, yeah, they continue. Yeah, if you're using AWX, um, every time it runs a job, it puts another graph on, on the chart. And there's two lines, a red line and a green line. The green line is how many um, hosts were successful in that job, and the red line is how many hosts were unsuccessful. So you can get, click on that dot on the graph and it will show you here's a host that wasn't run up and you can try to rerun the job on this host. Okay. Yeah. You can call people and be like, can you please turn the laptop on and just go to get work. And then run the clip up. Um, okay, so we've uh, created our Apache web server file here. Yep, made it look good. We had some nice indentation and everything there. Um, since this is instruct, we don't need to save anything because it doesn't work. Anyways, uh, within the Apache module, we want to use the copy module to copy the HTML file over to our www.html index.html. And then host notes we're going to change the name to, we're going to change it from web HTML to index.html. Right? Okay. Um, sorry, was, for the file extension for YAML files, isn't the default, unless you're on Windows, where they always like to use three character extensions, yeah. isn't it YA? ML, so yep. we're there. So, so Linux, Linux, Linux will be the one. Hmm? Linux will be the one. So Linux doesn't care about extensions at all. 
There's no nothing no, in my human suit. I do. Right, but so this anonymous. It, it, it just what is the most common on um, in a Linux environment? Depend on the developer. It's, it's 50 50 is my research. Like sometimes I see YAML, sometimes even when you download examples from that app, it'll be that YAML, my AML, and other the, times it's the not my. I asked too, because uh, we had a bunch of existing files mm -hmm. that all had the four letter extension, and then someone new came on, yeah. and then he started doing all these ones with the three letter. I'm going, so what is it? Before you enter, we have a really short conversation about how that happens to everybody just asks to use Rel or Fedora as their laptop operating system. And then we had people come in who were like, oh my gosh, I can't the function to all without my MacBook. And so we start going MacBooks. And then we had another acquisition, and that group of people came around right at and they're like, what is a MacBook? I don't know what Rel is. Can I just please have my Windows laptop back? And so I think it depends on what kind of environment they're so, doing the development. Yeah. So let me give you an example. And you refuse to use Rel as a Linux Windows, you should just you should just yeah. That's just my guess. <laughs> this, it's just my guess. It depends on where the file was created. If it was created on Windows, that's a Linux also. So I um, took my laptop here from work. I just counted all the files that end in YAML and compared that to all the files that end in YML. And I have about 13,000. 500 uh, on YAML, and I have 4,600 on YAML. So almost 50 50. Almost 50 50. Right. 50. Oh, right. it's like, so it's not, it's like, it doesn't really right. matter. So we I just like following conventions and like keeping, if just because in Windows you can do things 10 different ways doesn't mean you should always try to invent new ways to do it. Well, remember, the mind is what matters. If you came from a Windows environment, it's going to be YML. If you came from a Linux environment, it's it's good. Good. Then we'll put it in capital letters if you're from the one you're like. Does Ansible, if you run it, so under any dot configuration files, or space, space, home directory, Yes and no. There's one humongous one, and I don't think this is going to get into it, but it's not a dot file. It's ansible.cfg. If that's in your local environment, uh, directory, that's where all the standard configuration for Ansible what directories yeah. to look into, how to run, what versions to use of the Python interpreter. So, but you can have that in multiple in one. In, so you can have one directory, one project that uses one set of, let's say, Python versions, and another one that uses another set of Python versions. No, I, I just so asked because I don't want to digress, but I read a whole article on the history of dot files. Yeah, that, that will, <laughs> so on the target so box. No, 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 I was <laughs> yeah. On your target box, there will be a dot answer. Yeah. All right. So we're copying this file, right? So you can see we choose the build and copy command. We give it a source. Um, in this navigator YAML file, we probably build it where to look for files, right? But we give it a source, we give it a destination. And if you notice, the destination is a different name than the source. And just to make sure I was right, it probably says in yep, entries on the file service. What are you looking for? No, nope, it doesn't say anything. That's interesting. All right. So, so yeah, coming back over here, that's what it's going to do. It's going to copy. Right? Notice, notice something here. Like right? we are copying to a remote system. How does it know which one is remote and which one is local? Right. Like, you know, it's it's look basically taking a file that is local. And copying to a remote host. Yeah. So, but it, like yeah. so, but your syntax here doesn't say copy from local to remote. Like you use SCP, you give it a special syntax to indicate the host that you're copying from or to. That's not doing it. Now, there's a ton more parameters where you can control this, but by default, source is always local and destination is always remote. By default. Uh, uh, we had a couple. We have a. Uh, we have a. No, we had just one guy left. Um, no, I was going to say. I mean, uh, you know, I think Dan did well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, no, that David yeah. and 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 yeah. yeah. What was the problem? It is Ansible is not hard to learn. Usually yeah. takes people. Yeah. All right. So we're going to run that Apache file now that we modified it again. This time, the only thing the server should be up and running, Apache should be installed. So the first two tasks should come back as okay. And the third one comes back saying it changed, and that's where we have the file. Right? 
So we are looking good now. And if we verify that everything is running, we can either do like curl node rough node one. <laughs> well, he doesn't want to work based. Um, a batch is running fine thanks to Ansible. Yeah, Ansible's killing it. Um, and we can see that our output is just about the same. I've changed the indentation so much that it works. Um, but we can see that that's running just fine. It's serving up the page. Everything is looking really good. And at that point, I'm going to stop because I think that that's pretty much the end of our first playbook. We installed Apache, we got it up and running. We copied a web server file over to Apache. We made sure that the web server file is showing up when we go to access it. So our first our first playbook writing will we'll quite here. No, I love, I love this this interactive thing. I mean, uh, you know, tomorrow we had around you know lap two hundred or three hundred on the inside. There's a ton of places out there that does this now. Right? So if you go, to at least a, uh, any kind of Red Hat run training session, yeah. this is very common that you will have instructions on either the left or the right, yeah, and directly have access to your content. That's a company, right? And that's yeah, a that's right. a project. So let's, so let's do one more, okay? Because this is kind of cool. It gets into writing because remember we had two hooks yeah. in our inventory file initially, but we've only been using one. Um, modify the host line from node one to web. And if remember in our inventory file under host, we had two nodes and they were in a group called web. So um, coming back to that, uh, that one, not that one, but it's under that one. So we have web, um, run the playbook again. Okay. That is one of the. I haven't fun yet. <laughs> you need to do CD first, man. Yeah. I was trying to arrow up. That doesn't work. Okay, so now what we'll see is a little bit different in the way that it runs things, right? Um, so we have the facts on both nodes. Only one node should have a patch install. The other node needs to still have a patch install. So we'll see no queue change. Um, copy the web, node one is good, node two isn't, and then play recap, we're good. And I bet you it's going to have us run that curl command on both things. Nope, it's going to have us check the services. So copying this command over, um, we can see that now instead of just running on node one, we're going to run it on a group of nodes called web, but it's the same service fax module, so we're going to gather some facts about our services. And we're going to look at the HTTP service. When we run that, we'll see it return stuff for node one and then node two. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you which one is which, right? But hey, that's okay. They're the same. It doesn't have any. Um, and after that, we can go to the next file. If we wanted to, we could run that curl command. H one. And that's the other cool thing about the struct is it gives you a little bit of leeway to so do some experimentation on your own. But um, that's kind of the the uh, benefit of Ansible, right? Is when you want to do things on groups of servers, you have a thousand servers that you need to do something on. It's very easy. You just have to have them in your inventory file and then unleash the Ansible on that inventory file with whatever playback you want to run and it'll take care of all of that. A little bit of a testimonial, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of people in here study using Ansible well working robotics, and we have like a bunch of prototypes and have like 10 members and all that. It was really what I found really useful about Ansible is I stored uh, a bunch of variables in the inventory, as I mentioned earlier, but like which NIC is assigned to like which other hardware device that it interfaces, like this camera or other CPU and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool is by default they're all the same, except for when one breaks. So it was really cool. It was like when one breaks, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this NIC instead. I can codify that in Ansible and commit that. And now, whenever people update that system, it'll correctly assign the new NIC to it, even if something's broken. Yeah. And so, you so, so now it's like yeah. in the code, and you can see it. And also, you don't keep making the same Something yeah. else is kind of cool about Ansible, especially using the AWS component or Ansible controller, um, is you can actually you can 
compliance as code, which is, or not compliance as code, configuration as code, or infrastructure as code, which is a great buzzword nowadays. But you save all your, you can save all your YAML code in Git. And then you can tell um, Ansible, hey, look at this Git repo with the playbooks. And you can tell it before every playbook run, compare what you copy locally with what's in Git. And so you can sit there and do like configuration compliance boards where you're like, hey, I'm going to make this change to the structure. You committed as code in Git. And next time that playbook is run, Ansible's going to be like, oh, there's new code. We'll download new code and then run it right out of Git. So you can get to basically define what your infrastructure looks like. It has YAML. Mm -hmm. And another part that we're not looking at here, right? So remember all that kind of facts. That's basically all the information you have in the host. So the idea, for instance, of being able to pick the right NIP, if there's literally a variable structure that tells you all the NIPs in the box. Mm -hmm. yep. You don't have to hard code to say what are they called or whatever. You literally cycle through them, look for properties and say, oops, I can see this is on the right network. That's the NIP that we need to use in the rest of it. Because it and has you, all that metadata in there already. Yeah, and, and some of the stuff that we're suspension that's later on in this lab that we're doing. So you can see the next steps would have been um, adding variables. What to do using conditionals? So you can look at, you know, different conditions, whether it be different operating systems or different uh, states of the machine. Uh, using loops or so iterating through things. Um, handlers, which is a great way of saying, um, uh, what's a good example of a handler? If you make a change to a service and sometimes you need to restart it, you can use a handler to determine whether or not you need to restart the service. Uh, creating templates, so you can add variables and things like that, placeholders for variables inside of templates. After the template over and as part of the copy process, it changes all the variables in your template to their values. And then creating Ansible roles and and just having a playground that you can go and play with newfound Ansible knowledge. But try these labs, ansible.com, go to the learning tab, click getting started, self-paced labs, and you're in there. Um, another thing you can do is you can go to lab.redhat.com. And I think under build, we may have some. No, this is standard container stuff. So a lot of this is build based topics on this one. Um, but it's kind of neat that Red Hat's begun to do a lot of these indirect labs that people can just do whenever. Are um, these labs all free? Yep. yep. Now you have to have an account, but uh, accounts are free. So you just sign up with a, an account for free using your email address. Yep. Yep. And you know, basically, you know, anything has to be a legal thing. You have to, you know, oblige by the policies of not abusing it and all that. But once so, you've done that, it's all whatever you want to do. No, look here. They have actually have public sector stuff now. Yeah. Wow. I have a maybe stupid question, but. Seems like whenever you're running into the playbook the first time you run it, it has to it has to gather that information, right? The dev can't do that. It's it's dead and it's running perfect. No, you, you, can, you can put it down. Gather, gather you can, you, so, okay. for instance, if you're running things, let's say you're running things against AWS, and all you're doing is firing AWS API calls uh, to set up stuff. You can say, don't even gather. I, I'm on a local host. I mean, I don't want you to do. That's no point, right? You're not looking at your local. Uh, you can absolutely stop it from gathering, but you know it doesn't really matter. It's a Linux host. There's metadata to be collected. Right. It is the is the functionality of the playbook compromised at all? Depending on what your playbook does, because it's a variable structure that. So you know, on the conditionals, it's very common. You will say execute this if this is an Ubuntu type. If execute this if it's a Fedora type or whatever it is that you want to do. And that all comes in the metadata gathered. So if it can't do that, those things won't work. There are lots of playbooks that don't even remotely ignore that information, and hence they will have no problems running. So it depends on what they try to do. Right. And the reason I ask is, say, let's say you're, you're trying to write a playbook and you're, you're, you're trying to automate something across the whole host of centers. Um, would it ever run afoul of a specific like SC Linux policy where it's like? Sure. Like if it's probing for information, like don't do it. I mean, if it fails, run the command on the box. Like if you, if, if the user you're connecting as 
doesn't have the rights to say, look at a certain file. Let's say it restricts Etsy host. Um, right, I'm right. just doing that. Right. And you need to read that as part of your playbook. Right. Then it will fail, just right. like any other command will fail. Now, will it stop everything else? No, not really, depending on how you set it up. But in general, it will continue with all your hosts, but it will stop your host. The host that it fails sign will say, that task stopped. If there's an error handle, it will go down to that and maybe bypass it. If not, then it will stop the task for that host and, and give you an error report at the bottom. That says I have a hosts that didn't come to play. This is this is what gathers because I got I've done this, I've got the facts. Right. You're gonna actually just run it as a as a module. So I run it on my local host. I can see my IPv4 address, my IPv6 address, um, whether I have app armor uh, enabled or not. This is a store box, so it doesn't have app armor. Linux. Um, the architecture, I got my BIOS version, I got my BIOS vendor, a um, bunch of information, um, how it booted, the last time it booted, default IPv4, uh, device links, so different partitions, labels, Ansible devices, um, and just goes on and on. So, and uh, on. you know, a lot of that is probably readable on your host. But if your host prevents access to a servers or something is not there and your playbook assumes it is, yeah, you're going to get it. Yeah. Just and like anything else. Later on, if you keep doing that lab, when it goes to conditionals, it starts using some of the stuff out of gather to determine which path to take. Yep. Right? So it has to make a decision. So it might sit there and look at what's the distribution? Is it Fedora? Mm -hmm. Is it Red Hat? Is it Ubuntu? Is it Debian? Right, and that will change which module it runs based on what it sees as far as the facts and gather. So that's why I got this facts. But if you can't enable it, you can say gather phone calls and it won't gather facts. Just do it at the top of the But it does, it does gather facts just so it has all the, all the latest variables and it wouldn't make mistakes. But all of those are variables that are now available in your Ansible code that you can react to. As an, but an if statement, you can even add to this list. So these are not just for that gather. You can say, hey, I now have more information about this host, for instance, what type of web server or whatever else you want to gather. And you can store your data as part of that fact. And it's now available to other folks. So, a lot of cool stuff there, right? Um, and also with the some of the headings, like we look for services before. That's not in here, even though you said it was. Oh, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's in the service tag. No, then that's what your module does. It, it calls the command to show you all the services and sends it back to you. It's not part of your facts. Would Ansible ever be able to tell you what, if it was a, a, a messy Linux policy issue, would it ever be able to tell you specifically what? Or? It will give you the same error message you get on the command line. Well, depending on what your command line is set up to do, right? But you could have an error handler that goes in and say, I'm going to look at the latest ABCs. If you have root access, you can certainly get that, right? right. But a lot of error codes now will go out with a use as a troubleshoot with this ID. And if you do that, you can see, you know, you get the explanation. Right. You like to see, you're trying to hit a brick wall. Well, I can't get this playbook to run because I don't know why. I think it's a message from the policy, but I don't know. Well, so it's no different than without Ansible. That's the way it is. You know, if, if you don't get an action eye on a box and you go, I have no clue why I don't have access, then you have a, a challenge. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. Like it, if it works fine otherwise, but just running that playbook, everything else is fine if you get right. into it. But, just but it will tell you, hey, I can't write to this file. And that's the error message. Or I can't read this file. Yeah. Now, yeah. Okay. really like running the show. Would be the same thing. Yep. Well, then that would give you the error that you're making. Well, so specific to your question, focusing on Etsy Linux, really, I think what you would have to do is go to that box and do your Etsy Linux specific oh, yeah. shot log or those commands. Because if I am on a box and it's not an Etsy Linux issue, but it's a change log, you know, with file permissions, I might get permission denied because the actual mm -hmm. permission is blocking, or the permissions may allow me, but an SE Linux yeah. contact. You ab me. absolutely will find time where. So here's the challenge, right? 
as a normal admin we normal we are very customized well if there's a problem in the box log on to it and start diagnosing it what we're looking at the configuration as code infrastructure as code is to turn that around we, we really don't want to be logging on to x number of a thousand boxes that we manage we want the code to deal with it so what you're basically finding out if that's the problem you have a code error you have not configured let's say it's a random sign. Oh, you will go on and diagnose it, but you won't fix it that way. You will go in and change your playbook to set up these events correct, so all your boxes are now the same. Uh, and now you can run it over and over again and fix the problem on more than one box, mm -hmm. instead of having to go to each box to figure out who did it wrong. So, so that's usually how I write playbooks, is I'll try to manually configure one machine. Yeah. That's the same, and then I'll like, write the playbook one time, and then as I go, okay. and then I'll run the playbook yeah, yeah. You, you start with one version, but in, instead of fixing the box, you fix the playbook or the roles and all, whatever else you have in the background. And then eventually you have something you can run over and over and over again from your machines or update them, and they will all be the same. And you shouldn't get to the point where out of my 50 web servers, one of them for some reason has a configuration error that is not there. Now, you talked about compliance earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the. The issue is, once you do that, and you have one box that all of a sudden doesn't behave like the other ones, you have a compliance issue. And now the question is, who the heck changed this box without going to our change management system? And you may now be able to pinpoint and say, we have a compromise. We have something going on that is unplanned. That is a much bigger issue than a bug in a script. Um, so one of the things Ansible can do is to say, give me a report of everything that I'm telling you things should be, and what are you seeing? So you can actually see, are you in compliance with this script? And if someone has changed it, let's say on the command line, to do something else, you can now raise that flag and do something about it, um, to the degree of like killing the box or re reinstalling it or whatever you want to do. But you should never get to the point where you have a script like this that fails in one out of an X number of boxes. It, it means the script is wrong. You have assumptions in there that the script doesn't deal with. And that should be the problem. Now, right now, there may be a long time before you get to that step, but that should be your end goal. I guess if you find it more significant on the policy, because if you say clients will, hey, if when you're doing this, set of course, you can do diagnosis that way too, yeah, absolutely. But in the end, it's it's a static world, right? So in, you you have a set of policies, and if that's not correct in that box, you need to figure out what do I need to do to make that correct. And if that's a matter of this applying a custom policy, you find that once you sensible to deploy that, and now you have the same policy applied to all your boxes. If that's the case, or worse, right? Someone changed the stupid policy in the box and to wipe it out. You make sure it starts with a default set, and then add your own custom customization, your own rules, and all that stuff. And now your playbook sets them all up the same. Like we had Apache, read my home directory. Maybe that's what you want to be able to do. Right? So you said all all that stuff is now part of what you need to configure as part of the playbook. Um, so there's a ton of stuff missing in this simple playbook that will set up all that environment. Right? We just install a package. We didn't care about what. Anything else is what, what about a firewall? Uh, it's a Linux, as you say. Uh, it, what kind of execution right should uh, Apache has? How many threads should it be allowed to run? There's a billion things that was that was ignored here because that's not what the demo is for. But from a production perspective, you will need to have a much bigger playbook that does a lot of that. And that becomes this, but you should not have two, if they're both the same type of web server. You shouldn't end up with two different configurations, and something is missing in the playbook. Right. Just taking uh, permissions, when I was reviewing our cookbook that does open source, like reviews of Ansible, I noticed that we were creating a directory, etc. SIA, with permission 0664, and of course putting in a config file in it with 0664, and I'm going, wait a minute, it's a bit, it's not turned on. But it wasn't an issue because the files uh, and, uh, was owned by root and things were running as root and it seems root doesn't need to have executed it turned on to actually access it. Are you talking about the executing? I'm talking about the executing of the record. Yeah, okay, instead, so, of, instead of 0, 0755, it was 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0
zero six four four. Right. So the directory execute means you can see the files that are in it. If the execute bit isn't set, you if if you type ls, you won't see anything. But if you know the path to type it explicitly, if the file permissions allow you to access it, you can see. Uh, be. But if you tr if let's say you have read access to the file and you try to cat it, I can't cat that file unless I suit it. So for the execution of files, like say you have a Python file or something, if you do dot slash the name of the script, it will not work without the SQL list. But if you do Python and then pass the path to the file, it will work. I don't know is why it's different, good, but, it, but it's, it's never a good idea to have read access on a directory but not execute. No, Normally, I would say that it you're not intending to execute the file, you're intending to execute the directory. In whatever group, whether it's the user group or other, if you're intending people to access things in there, for the most part, the directory should have the execute. Because then those people can see what is in the directory. Uh, opposite. Execute doesn't allow you to see the files, it allows you to ex uh, access them. Well, it really allows you to see the list of uh, the yeah. traverse. Yeah. We know. Yes. I mean, but, not, not see the contents of the file, but see the metadata from the directory. You can't, you can't do an LS on it, but you can. You read is the only thing that where you can't do an extra the file inside the directory where you have read permissions on, you can't cat the file unless you're suited, unless you're root. Yeah, so yeah, I just checked it and I've never noticed that I don't need to execute it here. And that's interesting. And I just tried it out and yep, uh, it's root, I can access the directory and content of it. Now, it can bypass the Linux rules, but there's a lot of weird things in your UID zero that the OS basically ignores, and this may be one of those. Uh, I'll but but in to. principle, you don't want to rely on the fact that root can override the lack of executes. At this point, if I switch the user to yeah. nobody later, yeah. you know, and, and then suddenly the file broke, so it's you, supposed to have. You should never, in my opinion, you should never have a permanent thing running on your proxy's root. Use the, the, the old traditional thing, have a normal user being that temporarily gets you start as root, you then de escalate back to a normal user that has the Wi Fi. You get root in order to get whatever root needs to give you in the olden days, but then you're no longer root when you're done. And so, I mean, Apache does it, Nginx does it, I mean, it's so common, FTP does it. Right? So, you, you get a normal user, and it should always have. Like I said, if there's no execute on the directory, good luck getting into it. Because right, you can't use the files, you can't go into the next directory and all that stuff. Right. Um, we, we try to use files to be privileged too, but have non privileged. Do, do me a favor though, if you have access to that, can you, make, can you enable FACL and see if that's still the case with FACL? So um, I'm going to have to text. Well, okay. Well, I'll hit, the, I'll hit the stop and say, yay! Thank you! Yeah, all right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. If you, they,